My name is uh, Audie Barbosa, <clears throat> and in 1952, uh, I was a squad leader, machine gun squad leader, with Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. And we had just transferred from the east coast of Korea to the west coast. And everybody gave a big sigh of relief, because the hills in central and north Korea were out of this world. Unbelievable. And uh, rumors was flying that we were going to make an amphibious landing, uh, but that never came about. Instead, we uh, <clears throat> went into the trenches, and uh, trenches that stretched from one side of Korea to the other side. And it was very eerie. What I mean by that, uh, especially about 5.15 in the morning, when the mist starts to roll in, you're in a trench, and you look up, you see the barbed wire and the sandbags, and you could swear you were in France in 1916. Unbelievable. And it did. It left you with, a, I don't know, an odd feeling. Well, anyway, <clears throat> uh, out on that outpost, we had a reinforced rifle platoon. And that was, uh, came to, the, it was eight, actually 80 Marines on the hill. And uh, we had two light machine guns and two heavy machine guns and uh, 160 millimeter mortar was our artillery. <laughs> anyway, uh, life out there wasn't bad. The only drawback, and we didn't notice this at first, was the fact that the color of our uniforms were the same color of the uniforms uh, of the Chinese. Now the cut was different, but you know, uh, at night, and you can't see. Uh, you don't want to hesitate in combat, but on the other hand, you don't want to shoot a fellow Marine. And so that there was a little problems with that in the beginning. Anyway, like I said, the duty out there wasn't bad. Uh, Chinese did the same thing that we did. We'd go out two in the morning, the four, and see if we could capture a Chinaman, and the Chinese would do, do the very same thing to us. Well, <clears throat> one, uh, one night they did, they did kind of give us a warning as to what was to happen. They sent out, I, I, I'm going to say, about eight Chinese, and they were armed with automatic weapons, and were firing nothing but uh, traces. Now, I gotta say one thing for the Chinese, they were very patient. And that's one problem that we'll never solve in this country. Americans are not patient. And these Chinamen, these soldiers, were able to get right up to the barbed wire without being spotted. And uh, then what they did, they just fired into our outpost, nothing but traces, and uh, I remember this one soldier, the way our gun was located, uh, we, we could have got all of them, I'm certain. In fact, my gunner was jumping up and down. He wanted to fire, but I, you know, I didn't give him permission because uh, I realized that if I let him fire and we killed all of them, 
the gunner the next day would have had my head and used it as a soccer ball. Because they were there for one reason, and that was to get us to fire at them. To give away our positions as to where uh, they actually begin. Well, this went on for at the most 10 to 15 minutes. And the only thing I remember that about that incident was this one Chinese soldier was firing into our position, but he wasn't even looking where he was shooting. He was talking to his buddy, and he must have told him a joke because his buddy just started laughing like hell. Then, like I said, uh, you know, they quit firing and packed up and left. And, <clears throat> and uh, the next day, about 3.30, they uh, fired three 120 millimeter mortars at our position. One was short, one was long, and one was right on that outpost. So we knew what they were doing, but what could we do about it? Nothing. So that night, uh, got off watch at uh, 11 o'clock with my uh, gunner. And in those days, uh, it's a little different. Today, they're all volunteers. Now, back then, there weren't. I had draftees, reserves, and regulars in my squad. Woo! Never ever a dull moment. But I must say that that night, each one of them stood tall. The draftee, the regular, and the reserve. So Danny and I, we, uh, you know, made some coffee, kind of unwound. And just shoot the breeze. And what what uh, what do we talk about? <laughs> it's like I tell these young recruits. There's only one subject, and that subject is uh, girls. That's what you talk about. And I think that uh, that's gone on since ever there was <laughs> anybody's army. And at about 11:25, we said, "Oh, let's call it a night." And uh, we took about two steps. And the entire skyline lit up. Uh, it was unbelievable. And it was almost like it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we heard this boom, 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 boom. So I said to Danny, somebody's going to catch hell tonight. And little did we know until we heard that first incoming round as it whistled in on our position that it was going to be us. And they fired rockets, mortars, artillery, 76s, woo, for a good half hour. That little outpost just shook. And we were helpless. There's nothing we could do. Couldn't make it back to the gun. Uh, we just had to lay there and just hope, you know, we'd make it. And it was one of those situations where you, you say that, you know, Oh, God, if you get me out of this one, I promise I'll go to church every Sunday. Now, of course, you don't, but, you know, you'll answer for that later. Anyway, like I said, this went on for a good half hour, and then all of a sudden, silence. And we seen two green flares go up in front of us, two green flares behind us, and two green flares on each side, or our flanks. I looked at Danny, he looked at me, and uh, I'm going to tell you what it was really like. He, he looked at me, we looked at each other, and we said this word. Now, this is a famous word. No matter where you go in the world, you say it, people know what you're talking about. That word, that word was shit. And uh, <laughs> we did get back to the trench, and uh, the gunner was there. And he said to me, I want you to move. Uh, your squad down the finger. There were actually two fingers. Dewey was on one, I was on the other. And uh, then he just turned around and walked away. So I saddled up the squad and moved down the finger and then the finger, the ridge line, and we called it a finger. Um, and then uh, told Danny, set the, gun, set the gun up here. Now, Here's where your discipline comes in. He didn't look up at me and say, Sergeant Barbosa, are you trying to get me killed? 
I'm silhouetted. I'm on the skyline. This is the worst place we could put the gun. He knew it, and I knew it. But it was the only place we could put that gun. Because as I was going down the finger uh, with the gunner and the assistant gunner, I was also looking at the terrain. And uh, I you know, said to myself, when our turn comes, I wonder which way they'll come. And I happened to guess right. I picked it. Uh, but in order to cover that area with the machine gun, the gun had to be exposed. But that's what you paid for, right? And then all these young Marines holler back, right? You know. <laughs> and um, we started firing uh, in support of Dewey. And uh, at the odds at that, that battle, there were 700 Chinese that attacked us that night, and we had 80 Marines on that hill. <laughs> and uh, now, I don't know what it was, and to, till to this day I still don't know, but something was bothering me. Something, I don't know. It's hard to say. I like to think later on it was my sixth sense uh, because I couldn't see down the, the finger or the ridge line that we were on, uh, only to a certain per point, and the rest was, you know, just too dark. So I uh, said to Stark, who was the assistant gunner, I said, I want you to throw an illumination grenade uh, down this finger. He got one, pulled a pin, let it pop, counted about two, threw it. And when that went off, let me tell you, I was stationed in China for almost two years. I never seen so many Chinamen in my life. Uh, <laughs> They were sitting there, <clears throat> uh, the gunner, the Chinese gunner was getting his gun in action, and uh, the squad leader, or whoever he might be, I don't know, he was pointing at us, at our gun. And uh, this, I didn't understand. It must have been at least 30 Chinese, I'd say a platoon, and they were behind the gun, watching what was going on like they were at a soccer ball game. Anyway, the Chinese got off the first burst, fired about five rounds. So it indicated to me that this guy knew what he was doing. So I told Danny, but see, I, the Chinaman must have really been, been nervous. And in fact, that night, I think everybody on both sides was nervous. And uh, he got off five rounds, and he was high. And I said to Danny, I want you to kick up the dirt in front of that gun. He did, and he got uh, the gunner, the system gunner, knocked over the machine gun, and uh, killed the uh, squad leader, if that was what it was, and a bunch of those people that were watching the spectacle. Of course, then they, you know, all, they all scattered, and, uh, uh, you know, our fun then just began, because <clears throat> we couldn't help do it any longer. Uh, we had our hands full. Now, uh, I also got to tell a story of Frank Jeffs. He was a young Marine, 18 years old, uh, hated the military, all branches of the military, and uh, he gets drafted. And where does he end up? In the Marines. And I'm telling you, he almost died. And this guy was the biggest complainer in the entire 1st Marine Division, 2nd Army Division, the Air Wing, and the Girl Scouts. He was at it 24 hours a day. But I, I gave him slack because when we were ever on the move or out on patrol, I never had to go back to the end of the squad and say, Frank, keep up with the squad. And uh, he was always there. So I felt that when the squad got tired of listening to his song and dance, they'd take care of it. And they did, but that's another story. So how long this took, I don't know, uh, happened very early. The gunner and his son and his assistant gunner were hit by uh, shrapnel and small arms fire.
both at the same time. And at this point, <clears throat> after those two were hit, there was just Frank Jeffs, the big complainer, and myself left. And uh, we had our hands full. But we broke up an assault, and we were just laying there, and I was thinking to myself, I could not see how we were going to get out of it. No way in hell. So I, you know, I figured time, numbers, and ammunition. <clears throat> so I said to Frank, you know, Frank, well, do you think we're going to make it? Now, this is the Marine that hated the Corps. I mean, he was complaining 24 hours a day. And his answer came from deep down inside him and just blew out. And what did he say? <clears throat> He said, hell yes, we're Marines, aren't we? And I couldn't believe what he said. Now the Chinese threw three hand grenades before they started their assault on us. And two of them went to Never Never Land. You know, it's a good thing they didn't play Little League in China in those days, because those guys couldn't hit the side of a barn with a grenade. But one of the grenades got tied up in the web belt. The web belt was what held all the, uh, ammunition together, you know, in a long belt. And uh, you could, uh, well, open a can, and each can had 250 rounds. And, uh, but the third one, like I said, got hung up on a web belt. And uh, when that grenade went off, the way Frank and I were situated behind the gun, he took about 95% of that blast, mumbled a few words, and he died. Uh, well, Frank Jeffs was one hell of a Marine. And uh, there's that's uh, 700 Chinese. I still often think about that. How about 80 Marines held them all. Well, now Dewey, and we had a, everything happen that night. Uh, Dewey was to be awarded the Medal of Honor for what he did that night, uh, but he also shot the gunny. And this is, you know, like I said, the color of uniforms, uh, what a mess. They, you didn't know who was behind you. The only people you knew was, was who was in front of you. And uh, I often thought about that that night. I had no idea who was on my flanks. And I was, I was just very unfortunate, very fortunate. Uh, to me, the Chinese didn't have too much organization as when they were assaulting our positions. They did break our line. And the riflemen had a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, using whatever they could. Uh, entrenching tool pick, rifle butt, bayonet, K-bar, and uh, machine gunners were fortunate in that area. And uh, now, as I said, you know, Dewey uh, shot the gunny and how that happened, and I probably would have done the same thing. There were two seriously wounded Marines in the bush. And four Chinese soldiers come up behind Dewey's gun, and they hollered, and they're behind you, Dewey. And Dewey picked up two riflemen, two ammo carriers, went down, cleared the area, went back to his gun, and like I said, uh, I probably would have done the exact same thing he did. Uh, he heard his footsteps running. So he said to himself, oh, I, I didn't get them all. Takes his 45 out, spins around, pulls the trigger, and shoots the gunny. <laughs> you don't shoot gunnery sergeants in a ring call. I mean, that's a big no-no. Uh, and when Dewey realized what he had done, if he would have been a woman, he would have gave birth right there and then. And uh, all the gunny did was say, don't, don't, uh, don't be worried, Dewey. It was my fault. I should have let you know I was coming in. And it's a good thing, you know, like I said before, everybody's hand was shaking and it would, and that's, that's what saved the gunny's life because Dewey, when he shot the gunny, his hand must have been shaken because, uh, whew, 
uh, he hit him in the leg. If he would have been calm and cool and collective, he would have uh, he would have killed him. Because you know, God, he it was even less than ten yards that he was, you know, uh, on Dewey coming in, and. Uh, they then asked Dewey, can you hold his position? And I don't care if the whole Chinese army was coming down, uh, Dewey would have gave the same answer. Yeah, Gunny, we'll hold, we'll hold. And then the Gunny <clears throat> limped off, trying to get these riflemen back and uh, try to, trying to get them between the, uh, between the two machine guns, form some kind of a line, which eventually tried a lot of a lot of the riflemen, what they did was they fought in, in circles, like uh, fighting the old cowboy and Indian days. And uh, it was quite an accomplishment that those young Marines put up on. And uh, <clears throat> they started to break it off at about 3.20, 3.15 in the morning. Now, you know, combat's crazy. Here's a, why, first of all, they broke it off, I'll never know, because they had us. Uh, but they did. Maybe they didn't want to pay any more price than they already paid. And it's one Chinese soldier going back to his positions, and he takes a look and he sees, uh, this time Dewey is wounded, and a Navy corpsman is working on Dewey. And he takes a grenade, pulls a pin, lets it pop, tosses it in, Dewey picks it up and he's going to throw it, but where's he gonna throw it? Got no place to throw it. Too many wounded Marines all around him. So he says to the Navy corpsman, I got it in my back pocket, Doc. Took the grenade, tried to get it between the ground and his wallet, but he had to get his hand out of there in a hurry. And in doing so, uh, the grenade went off. But uh, it was a happy ending. Dewey survived, uh, but he, you know, he paid the price. He had trouble with his hip uh, from the time he was 20 to old. He's still still around. We get together, and uh, yeah, it, he uh, and for taking that grenade and laying on it, actually he laid it on his back. Uh, <clears throat> he was awarded the Medal of Honor for for that action that night. Um, by uh, General General Eisenhower, but uh, it was a night to remember, and I think, well, but, um, um, what did we learn? I don't know what we learned, uh, but it was really remarkable. We just concentrated on one thing, and that was taking care of each other, you know. And it, it was I had uh, one man in my squad, one man, one young man in my squad who had both his legs blown off. And all night long he was calling my name, and all night long I, you know, I said, yeah, well, I'm not going any place, Hunter. We'll be here, I promise you that. And of course I didn't know his legs were off at that time, and that morning when the corpsman came around and uh, you know, asked if I'd help put him on a stretcher, of course, you know, I'd help. And as I approached, it was still dark, it wasn't, wasn't light. And I reached down to put my hands where his legs would have been. But nothing, absolutely nothing. And then I took a good close look and, woo, he had a foot over here. Uh, yep, and he survived, but he died about three days later. Uh, and like I said, that's... Uh, that was one night, one night to remember. And we're a lot older now, and of course, a lot of it leaves you. But, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a major battle. And what I'd like to do is just read a sentence from the book, Our Post Wars. And, uh, I read as follows. Although not a famous battle, the firefight on OP3 was equal in courage to any of the last stands recorded in military history. 
There was one exception, however. This stand was successful, greatly outnumbering the Marines. Enemy troops failed in their objective, and most of the defendants survived. Now that's about the best way. I've got this book here, Outpost Wars, but uh, the story I just told you is 61, one or two years ago. And it's hard, it's, it's leaving, but I don't think I'll ever, ever really forget. And there was quite a bond that was made that night with those that did survive. And later on, those that were wounded and came back to the outfit. But uh, just a shame, it really is. And we all agreed on one thing, if you're gonna fight a war, do it like you did in World War II. Don't play games because you're only gonna lose people. And for what? For nothing. I'll stay away from that subject for a while. So that was the story. I hope I didn't bore you, but the point being that 700 Chinese assaulting 80 Marines were unable to take this outpost. And that's quite a compliment for the young men out there fighting. Uh, Now, how am I going to wrap this up? <laughs> I hope I I hope I didn't bore you. And, uh, you know, got to believe in yourself no matter what. Whether you're in the military or you're a civilian. And depends on what you want. The harder you work, the more you can have. If you'd rather just party and run around, that's fine too. But then don't cry in your beer when you're in your 60s. And, got no money and the government should do this or that. So I think I took up enough of your time and uh, too bad you're so far away. I'd like to go to the school and talk to you. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you young people take care of yourself. And remember, you're living in a great country. Thank you. Oh, damn. Jesus.